This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 237, recorded on June 11th, 2013. Hello everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. We are back on the road today. We are in Seattle in the state of Washington at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And joining me from North Central Florida is Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. Right across the table from me. Here we are on the road again. This is getting to be a delightful habit. Nice, a couple of weeks ago we were in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, right? Mm Now, what is amazing, I'm looking out the window here, and it is beautiful and sunny here. Isn't that incredible? Yep. Last time I was in Seattle, it poured. Well, uh, Seattle in the summertime, my son tells me, can be very, very nice, and certainly that's been my experience. There are actually mountains outside that window. That's, I can't see them. With you can't see them now. They're covered, but normally you have a great view. Normally there's some mountains out there, yeah. Right. The voice you just heard is our special guest today. He's a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Michael Emmerman. Hello there. Welcome to TWIV. My pleasure. Thanks for letting us come to this office. Wow, he's got a corner glass there looking out over on the... What what do you call the body of water that is... I guess we're not looking out on the water, is that right? Yes, we're looking out on Lake Union. Lake Union. The Lake Union leads out to the west to uh, Puget Sound and to the east to Lake Washington. Nice. So, is it unusual for it to be sunny this time of year? Uh, no, it can be sunny anytime. We have sun breaks in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> sun breaks. Okay. Great. Cool. So, we thought we'd come. We, Rich and, he, and I are here for study section. Right. NIH study section. Right. Your last. My last forever. That's right. Uh, well, who knows forever, but I'd like it to be forever. I did it for 11 years, and that's enough. Uh, but whenever we go to study section, we like to see if we can do a TWIV with local scientists. So that's what we're here to talk with Michael about today, his science. And um, before we do that, well, we covered the weather, right, Rich? No. What is well, the we said it was sunny. It's sunny. What's the we temperature? We do a temperature. Let's was. see who can get our weather app up first. We're <laughs> really slacking here. It did rain earlier. This Very time. briefly, yeah. but then it warmed up again. Yesterday it was, was beautiful, though. 18 degrees Celsius, partly cloudy. That's almost 68 degrees, I know that. Thanks. But you want to do it in Fahrenheit, That's I That's okay, that's okay. Michael, we it. want to talk with you about your science today, but before we do that, I'd like to know your path to getting here today. I want to start way back, as Rich would say, when you were haploid. When were you, where were you born? <laughs> I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Wow, would you have guessed that? No. No, not at all, but you can't no. really. Yeah. I went to Ohio State University. My father went to Ohio State University. My grandfather went to Ohio State University. Uh, uh, Ohio State family. Yeah. <laughs> Were you sports fans? Probably not, right? Uh, everyone who lives in Columbus is a that <laughs> kid. <laughs> it's like Gainesville, right? Yeah, that's right. Gainesville. Yeah, you can't you can't get away from it. Yeah. You know. You, really and, have you to. went to you went to Ohio State for college, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. then you did a PhD somewhere. Uh, yes, I did my PhD at University of Wisconsin Madison. Ah, what, roughly what years are we talking about? I was a graduate student between eighty one and eighty six. Okay, whose lab were you in? Uh, I was with Howard Temin. Now I I, I wow. either knew that or I would have guessed it. Okay, okay. yeah, he's pictures. There's right a picture there. of him up there. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! When did Howard die? I believe he died in ninety five. No, no, ninety three maybe. It was, it was around there. So I don't want to do insider baseball, but um, our friend from Connecticut, the DNA uh, replication. Yeah, Sandy Weller. Sandy. Did you know Sandy Weller? No, I, I do know have, Sandy, but she. She must have predated. She, you. yeah, she left before before I got there. Great place for for the listeners. Howard Temin was uh, a famous retrovirologist who was. Uh, one of the people who first described uh, reverse transcriptase and won a Nobel Prize for it. And we've talked and, about that on mm-hmm. TWIB for sure. And as I understand, a real, a real gentleman and a fine scientist. Oh yes, he, he was, 
He was the most brilliant person I ever met. Hmm. And then after that, you must have done a postdoc, right? Yes, and after that, I went to uh, the Pasteur Institute and ah. did a postdoc with Luc Montagnier. Oh, wow, okay. Is that pre-HIV or post-HIV? No, that must be post. So I was a graduate student when it was discovered that HIV, that AIDS was caused by a retrovirus. Right. And I worked on retroviruses at the time. I worked on retroviruses in terms of um, models of gene regulation. And at the, I figured out what I actually wanted to work on were not viruses as tools, but viruses as pathogens. So at the time, there were only a few places you could go to, to work on HIV, and Paris being one of them. So you went there? So I went there. Great. How long were you there? I was there for three years. I was there from 86 to 89. And did you work on HIV there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So That's was, why I went there. Was just recently isolated, right? So everything that you did was probably new. Yeah, everything was new. <laughs> uh, so I was there when they first sequenced HIV-2. That was one of the first things I worked on with mm -hmm. the people who were there who were working on it. How, so how soon after HIV-1 was identified came HIV-2? Do you remember? So HIV-2 was 86. So Three a couple years. years later. Yeah, a couple years yeah. later. Okay. And then uh, did you come right here to the, to the Hutch after that yeah, post? Yeah, so I came to Hutch. So this is the only place I've ever been. Yeah, like uh, me. So when, did you, when then did you arrive at the Hutch? So I got here in, in 89. 89. So I've been here 24 years. Wow, okay. So I want to know, uh, and then for the listeners among other things, but I want to know uh, the history of the Hutch. What is it? How did it get here? Uh, Fred Hutchinson was a baseball player. Okay. He managed a team called the Seattle Seattle Pilots. Right. Um, she's a picture downstairs. He was a coach for the Cincinnati Reds, I believe. I think he played for the Tigers and he was coached for the Reds, but I might have that backwards. Uh, he died of leukemia. His older brother, um, Bill Hutchinson, founded the, the center in his name. Uh, Bill Hutchinson was good friends with Warren Magnuson, who was chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. Okay. So they had, they got money. Okay. And so when was it established? I should know this, but I believe it was around 75. It's, okay. You know, it's a pretty new center. Okay. You know, one of the things when I first interviewed here was, so at University of Wisconsin, there was this whole floor, uh, the McCarter Labs where I worked, there was this whole floor where all the emeritus uh, professors were. And, when there was a seminar, they would all walk down to the seminar room from the top floor where their offices were. When I interviewed here, one of the things that seemed strange was I couldn't figure out where all the old people were because <laughs> there, were, there weren't any. And the oldest person here was younger than I am now. Uh huh. Okay, because it was a because it was a new place. Yeah. So uh -huh. this place, the Hutch, as many people call it, I guess you call it the Hutch, is a collection of research and treatment clinical buildings as well, right? Where they treat patients with various cancers, I presume. Yeah, so there's an outpatient clinic. So they do the, so they're famous for bone marrow transplants. So E. Donald Thomas won his Nobel Prize for the bone marrow transplants for leukemia. Okay. And um, they are, the transplants themselves are now done at the university and the outpatient clinic is shared between the university and the Hutch and Children's Hospital and that, that is here. So the Hutch has a very large public health sciences um, division, mm -hmm. has a clinical division, um, and has basic sciences. And the thing that we are in now, which is called human biology. And there are quite a few virologists here, right? Yeah, it's a really good place for virology. We have a meeting every Thursday that we've had for the last more than 20 years, a different virology lab. So uh, how is the Hutch funded? From the NIH. From the NIH. So it is an official NIH cancer center. Yes, it's a comprehensive cancer center. Okay. And that must be a something that has to be competitively renewed now and then. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think it's every okay. five years. Okay. All right. And you have, um, can you have students, graduate students, for example? And if so, what institution would they be affiliated yes, with? Yes, we have a great graduate program, which I can say because I'm one of the directors of. 
and uh, we share this graduate program. It's called the Molecular Cellular Biology Graduate Program. It's shared between the Hutch and the U. So graduate students in my lab either come from that program or come from, I also have an affiliation with the, univers with the microbiology department. So either come from the joint program with the Hutch or they come from micro now or the, from pathobiology. The University of Washington physically is uh, a fair distance away, right? I mean, I mean what it seems about, to me. Um, so I just rode my bike back from there. It's about 20 minutes by bike. Okay, so that's not too bad. So do the students attend classes there or are there classes here as well? They have both. Okay. So we have classes here and there are also classes at, at the U and they, they take classes both places. And do most or all uh, fa uh, researchers uh, working at the Hutch have faculty appointments at the U or just some? How does that work? Uh, most faculty here have a joint appointment at the U. Okay. Um, all the ones with graduate students have joint appointments at the U. Okay. So when you came here to start your lab in 89, you, you started working on HIV, I presume? Oh, yes. And yeah. you've been working on HIV ever since, right? Mm -hmm. So when you first, I wonder if you could paint us kind of a broad picture of how your interest has evolved in that time from 89 to the present. What, you, what were you doing when you first came here? Uh, when I first came, it was more um, function of the HIV genes. So what, what did these genes do that didn't have any necessary role? So we call them accessory genes and that you could mostly delete them and nothing happened. <laughs> and those I always thought were the most interesting ones because those are the ones which are going to be interacting with the immune system to be important in vivo. And, at the time, we just, they just had letter names. So this is, I want to uh, back up here for a minute. I'm doing, once again, I'm doing this as, uh, for the listeners because I don't think we've ever really done this uh, in detail. You said these are genes that when you delete them, nothing happens. That's nothing happens like in cell culture, right? right? So the virus still replicates. And typically, in my experience, these are genes that, uh, as you call them, accessory genes, that if you then, however, uh, challenge an, uh, an animal with these viruses, that's when you see something happen, okay? Yes, so exactly. Yeah. So they're and accessory because they interact with the immune system or so it's on an organismal level. They aren't the nuts and bolts of replication, but they're the subtleties of the virus interaction with the organism, right? Is that a fair s description? Yes, for the most part, they are genes which interact with the immune system. So the basic retrovirus is uh, GAG, which is a core gene, and PAL, which is the polymerase and integrase and, uh, and uh, protease, and uh, ENV, which is the envelope glycoprotein. And then, so, and there are retroviruses that are stripped down and have nothing but that, right? Yes. And then, but the HIV are the more complex guys, and they have these accessory genes. So there are other. Yes, the lentiviruses have other genes, but other classes do. The delta retroviruses have other genes. Okay. So HTLV, for example, uh, the foamy retroviruses have other genes. Okay. Uh, the beta retroviruses have other genes. It's, it's mostly the gamma retroviruses, which are the ones which are just stripped down to GAG, Paul, and okay. everybody else has something All right. else. All right. Um, some of these were. Some of these extra genes are, are, are regulatory, so they are necessary for replication. Okay. For the transactivators, uh, the, uh, the REV protein, which is important for transport of RNA out of the nucleus. So that was one of the things that we worked on in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So you got interested in these accessory, in quotes, I'm putting up the air quotes, genes at an early time. And these are VIF, for example, VPU, VPR? So VIF. VPU, we did a lot of work on VPR. VPR is a really neat one. Um, and, and you wanted to find out what these proteins did, right? Yes. So what, give us a, a summary of what they do. Uh, VIF is responsible for the neutralization of a antiviral factor called ApoBac, ApoBac 3G primarily. Uh, VPU is responsible for in HIV-1, VPU is responsible for the neutralization of an antiviral factor called tetherin. It also downregulates a certain number of cell surface proteins, um, host cell surface proteins. Uh, NEF 
interacts with a lot of different things, and it also downregulates cell surface proteins. Um, in the SIVs, NEF is the thing which counteracts the, the tetherin protein. Um, DPX is one which neutralizes a antiviral protein called SAMHD1. DPR in s some SIVs also downregulates or causes degradation of SAMHD1. And in HIV1, DPR has a peculiar function of causing cells to arrest in the cell cycle. There is a mystery of how it does that. So we talked about April Beck in Minnesota. Right. You may know Reuben Harris. Works yes, on I know Reuben. Ep the April Beck proteins. And we thought, so this is a, a cytosine deaminase? Yes, they're cytosine deaminases. C's go to use on the minus strand. And these are packaged in the virion, and if it weren't for VPU, is it? VIF. VIF. Can't remember. No. Can you remember them? No. So if it weren't for VIF, it would deaminate the genome, mutagenize it to death, and the virus would be non-infectious, right? Yes, that's true. But it, uh, because of the, the, this VIF, it uh, gets, gets around that. Okay. And um, Sam HD1. Now, I, I'm, I'm neighbors with Steve Goff mm -hmm. at Columbia, who you probably know. Yes, of course. Probably saw him a couple of weeks ago at Cold Spring Harbor, I guess. And he's always fascinated by Sam HD1. What does Sam HD1 do? Sam HD1 is a host protein that um, degrades nucleotides. So it's anti one of its antiviral roles is that in cells which are non-dividing, which have low nucleotide pools, it takes that nucleotide pool down below the KM of the reverse transcriptase. Ah. So that um, reverse transcription doesn't go to completion or goes slower. And it is a gene which is induced by interferon. Okay. And it's, um, it's a really clever antiviral. And it has no effect on the host cell because the KM of cell polymerases are different from the RT? Is that the idea? Yes. Yes, well, and the idea is in rapidly dividing cells, the, the um, nucleotide lip pools are too high anyway. High. It's, it's actually not a very good enzyme. Right. It, supposedly, I'm not an enzymologist. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Okay. So these are some of the cell proteins that are antagonized yeah. by these. So one of the key things things. here is that HIV, the lentiviruses infect non-dividing cells. So they infect, they can infect these cells which don't go through mitosis, which is different than um, many other retroviruses, the gamma retroviruses, for example. They cannot inf infect cells that go through mitosis? They can infect cells which don't go through mitosis. The gamma retroviruses require mitosis. That was one of the first things that I worked on when, when I first got here, was trying to figure out how they did that. Okay. And by virtue of that, it means that they, they have reverse transcriptases which can work under low nucleotide levels. So what SAMHD1 does is it takes that nucleotide level down even further. So these, these antiviral functions that the cell is elaborating, APOBEC, SAMD1, the TRIMS, others. Tetherins. Tetherins. Tetherins, yeah. Are they there for the sole purpose of fighting viruses? Or do they have other, did they evolve for other reasons that have to do just with normal cellular function. Do they do anything on a, on a day to day basis? Do they have a day job? You know, I, I get asked that question at every single seminar I, I give. That's almost always the first question. What do these things really do? And the answer is this is what they do. They don't okay. do anything else. All right. I mean, the, the two arguments for that are when they are deleted, for example, in a knockout mouse, there is generally no phenotype except that the animals are more sensitive to viral infection. Mm -hmm. uh, the other argument comes from the stuff that uh, Harmeet Malik and I do, is that these genes are under really intense rapid evolution mm -hmm. because of their selection, because of their genetic conflict with the viral genes. So if they had a normal cellular metabolic function, that normal function, whatever they're interacting with, would also have to be rapidly evolving to keep up. Mm -hmm. and so. It's hard to do that. So they are in gene families where some other members of that gene family do have essential roles. Uh, for example, the APOBEX are related to, um, to AID, which is necessary for um, rearrangement in, in B cells of the immunoglobulin genes. Okay. So that's not one that 
that that's one you do need. Okay. Um, but the APO backs are, are have evolved so that this is this is what they do. Uh, I want to take a detour for just a second here because uh, Vincent interviewed Hermit mm -hmm. uh, in a in a previous TWIV, um, and I would be interested in knowing how the two of you connected and when. So we connected not long after Harmeet uh, joined the faculty. I gave a talk at a, one of our faculty retreats and was talking about one of these antiviral genes. I think it was Apobac, actually. And Harmeet, Harmeet's emphasis was genetic conflict of uh -huh. two ent entities which are evolving around each other. Uh -huh. And he came up to me afterwards and said, this would be a great thing to look at, of the evolution of VIF and Apobac and how they may be evolving around each other. And Had he already been looking at genetic conflicts that involve pathogens? No, he was looking at genetic conflicts um, involved in, um, in centromeres and in speciation oh. and in, in, in other places, but not, as, not really as pathogens. Okay, interesting. Okay. And so had you thought of it in those terms before that? No. no. Oh, no, no. No, we didn't think of it. Even, actually, even as we, even the... The first project, we weren't actually thinking of it in the terms we yeah. think of it. So our, the first uh, guinea pig to do this kind of thing between our labs was Sarah Sawyer, who right. I think you also interviewed. Yes. Um, she did such a great job at it. We kept on going. Right. So th that was really the origin. Or I should ask you, not tell you. Was that the origin of your interest in paleovirology as studying so the So the science? paleovirology um, grew out of that. As I said, we actually didn't really understand what we were doing the implications of what we were doing in the beginning. It's, but uh, one of the things that Sarah Sawyer found looking at the evolution of Apobac 3G was, was that it, the positive selection was very ancient. And it, most of the positive selection on Apobac 3G could not be explained by lentiviruses, the lentiviruses we know today. What, why? Because they don't go back that far? Because most of the positive selection was not in the place where VIF interacts with it. Okay. And the Apobac three, the Apobac three family is under such intense pod selection that it's under so selection kind of in every lineage all the time, and that's where we got this idea that there are actually much more ancient things which are driving the selection of these genes. And for some of them, we believe that some of that selection are um, are retro elements, so line elements, allo elements, that they are that's what they are in genetic conflict for. The actual conflict between Apobac 3G and VIF, it took us a lot longer to figure that out, but we figured that one out too, when we figured out where to look for it. But that was the origins of the paleovirology, was the understanding that these antiviral genes have been under selection way far back. So you're thinking that uh, something like uh, Apobac was under selection from something that may not have even been a lentivirus from way back? Oh, yes. So uh, there are many sources of, of conflict for these antiviral genes that are not just lentiviruses, or not just the viruses we know. Um, yes, the Apobex, they also deaminate uh, retro elements. Okay. And much of, there is selection on them that we cannot explain by VIF, which we ascribe to these other things. Okay. So how can you tell that Apobec is ancient. Basically, this is a very fundamental question for our listeners. How do you, in, 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 you go into your lab, what do you do to tell that it's an ancient protein? So we sequence the gene from lots of different um, species. We use primates. So we sequence it from lots of primates. Okay. Then we can reconstruct the ancestral sequence at each node of a phylogenetic tree. We can then look at when the evolution has occurred because we can reconstruct the ancestors. And so we can see that there was evolution between 20 million years ago and 10 million years ago because it's between two nodes and a phylogenetic tree. Okay, so even though you're sequencing animals that exist today only, you can go We can recreate that. the past. Okay, how far back can you do that? Uh, with primates, we can go back 40 million years. After, primates are, are a good set because the 40 million years is, is, is a good place to be without losing signal because of saturation. Is that, is that clock set based on the fossil record? Yes. Okay. Well, it's, it, 
it's calibrated to the fossil record, and it's also set by using a molecular clock on genes which are not under selection. So genes which are under neutral, things which are neutral, so there's no positive or negative selection. You, you can set a molecular clock, and you can calibrate the clock to fossils. Uh, is, that, is that molecular clock ultimately cal uh, calibrated to the fossil record? So it's calculated the fossil records in the sh at the shallower end. Okay. You know, so we have fossils of hominoids back, you know, where you know, 10 million years is good. You know, there aren't any fossils that, there aren't many fossils we can use of primates that go back kind of that far. Okay. But I could be wrong about that. <laughs> uh. All right, so by this method, you can tell that Apobec goes back quite a ways. So the selection of Apobec goes quite a ways. So you can tell just Apobec goes back sure. further just because it's present. It's present in, in those. But the selection, meaning the changes at specific residues, say in this case, that interact with VIF. Is that the right protein, VIF? Yeah, VIF is the right protein, <laughs> yes. So, so that's a case where we, we know where to look on Apobec because we know uh, what are the sites which can change its interaction with different VIFs. So VIF binds Apobec and that's part of the way it disables it. Right. Binds apple back and it brings it to a degradation complex. Right. So those interaction complex. residues you can look at through phylogenetic time and see how they change. Right? You can see how they change and then we can test their change by testing um, the interactions with different existing VIFs. So do you actually have biochemical evidence for this uh, interaction? So you can actually isolate the proteins and see them interact? So we have functional interactions where um, if the VIF gene will, will bind to an apobac, it will neutralize it and virus will grow. Okay. So that's the kind of thing we do. All right. um, the actual kind of structural thing, we would love to get people interested in doing this. Okay. So what you need is you need um, a series of structures of different proteins, different ones of these proteins where we know the positive selection is and its antagonist that right. would kind of show whether or not the things that we think, the things we know under positive selection and we think our interaction sites are actually interaction sites. Right. So you can actually see it in a structure. That would be great. Yes. Although, um, this is part of my heritage from Howard Temin is that we don't do biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> we do genetics. We do a little biochemistry, but. He had to have done a little bit to find reverse transcriptase, yeah. right? Um, Yes, although he would have claimed that he knew it existed before that. <laughs> okay. But it must have, did you ever meet Temin? I never no, did. No, I never met him. He was certainly alive when I was training back then, but I never met him. Interest would have been interesting. No, he should have. Um, so we have evidence for positive selection, meaning change at specific residues of Apobec that interact with VIF over phylogenetic time, right? Right. So... Can you tell us, so does it come and go, the, the, the interaction of, of the two proteins? Do they, are they, do they appear at some point long ago and then disappear and then appear again? Yes, they do. Is so there is, there is episodic. So that's some of the evidence that the, um, the challenge by lentiviruses or retroviruses are, is episodic, that a species gets infected, um, there are polymorphisms which are escape so that now they right. are no longer attacked by that, and then the virus goes away. And then millions of years later, it comes back again. So the survivors are the ones that had a polymorphism that could resist Apobec. Right? Yes. And then eventually, there will be new viruses which will come in from another species, most likely, which can have then adapted to those new polymorphisms. So that's the way the positive selection works. You have to have repeated rounds of selection yeah. to see it. Is it just this one protein that determines whether an organism would survive an infection, or is it just a major contributor? No, it's, it's kind of the constellation of all these antiviral genes. So no one of them is kind of a yes or no. They're all kind of shades of more susceptible, less susceptible. But there isn't one where you could say, yes, this organism is definitely susceptible because its apobac is not working. So give me a sense of how much time we are talking about for when a virus is introduced into a susceptible population and you get the selection of resistant animals so that you would see that in um, the Apobec protein, for example. Is it 100 years, 1,000 years, a million years? No, no, it's on the million year. Million years. Yes. 
It's on the million year time scale to, to see you, these kinds of selections. Because you must be you know, old. talking about generations of host organism, right? In yes. order in order for the selection to take place. So it depends on it depends on what the fitness cost is. What you know, what is the selective pressure, meaning how pathogenic is that virus? And how you know what its effect is on the progeny, kind of how you would see it. You know, so you, yes, you it's possible it could be seen in like ten thousand years. But something which is less pathogenic, it's gonna take Okay, much, so, much it took, longer than that. so today AIDS kills people, right? It's going to take millions of years for resistant humans to emerge in, in a similar way. Uh, we will have antiviral drugs, which will so we stop before that. So we intervene with evolution. We will intervene before okay. that happens. Okay, so we can't see this going on. But, and we couldn't see it in any other animal because it takes too long. We'd have to do it retrospectively, basically, right? There are the koalas. Yeah, I was going to say, the koalas are being endogenized, right? Yeah, the koalas have a retrovirus, and uh, one of the problems is that there's not a lot of polymorphism in, in koalas, so it's possible that, that we won't see it. But it, yeah, you know, that's the kind of case where stuff is happening in real time. Wow. So my 15-year-old my son asked me, Dad, do we intervene with evolution with microbials and antivirals? So now I have the answer. I said, I think so, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking at this uh, uh, PLOS pathogens paper uh, that uh, you sent us, and that's what we're talking about, right? The apobac 3 g vif interaction. Yeah, so that's the one. That's one where we were able to use the evolutionary signal to say that the primate lentiviruses are at least 5 million years old. Okay. And which is a much different figure than one got if you just made a phylogenetic tree of the viruses and try to go back to its ancestor. And, yeah, so how does that, is that because the molecular clocks were, are wrong if you just construct a phylogenetic tree of the viruses? Uh, yes. So the problem of the molecular clocks for, a, for an RNA virus is the evolution is too fast. That's, that's one problem. So, so you get a horizon. I thought so. And, that's, so there's, and there's a second problem, which is you have something called lineage extinction. So you only can see back to the last selective sweep. And after that, you can't see any back any further. Okay, and the RNA viruses evolve fast because they don't, their polymerases don't proofread, right? Yes. Uh, and so that, uh, that's what uh, gives you a miscalibration, if you like, of the molecular clock. Yes, well, it's that the, the clocks aren't constant, be, partly because of the sweeps and the selection, but they work well at, at a short term and they fall apart completely in, in a long term. And what, what kind of drove that point home was people finding, was papers that found endogenous copies of RNA viruses in genomes and seeing that actually if they were you know, so many millions of years old and if you had used a clock, you would never have gotten that. We did one of those a long time ago. Uh, Jeremy Bruin from Buffalo was one of the first people to publish on this, and that was a... Uh, now, other virus integrated into the genome, yeah, right? right. So there are quite a few of these. Yeah, now there are quite a few. Yeah, it's, right. it's been these enormous are, stuff. These are accidents, though, right? Yeah, there are accidents. But they but help us clock, they help us set a clock, right? They don't have the clock, actually. They, they tell us the clock's wrong. <laughs> they actually don't have... It's still a mystery of, of what's going on with the clock. But at least they tell us that these things are... The pathogenic viruses, pathogenic RNA viruses are much, much older than you would have calculated by just using sequences. So I don't quite understand your use of the term sweep. Could you elaborate on that? So a sweep is when one virus uh, replaces everything else that came before it. So for example, in 2010, um, there was a virus that came from swine, the H1N1, that replaced this seasonal flu. Okay. So if you sequence only the hemagglutinin in 2011, you would have said that influenza is, is, is a year old. <laughs> okay. okay. So that's the idea of a sweep. So, so, you know, if you have stuff in the freezer that went back, you know, you can tell it went back. But, you know, if you look at any given time, you're only looking back to the last, to the last sweep. So, uh, the so, so the idea of, of what Harmit and I do is we don't look at the viruses, we look at the host. Okay. 
And so the host can tell us, can allow us to go much further back. The host basically has a record of what its experience has been with these viruses. Yes. So that is what we call the paleovirology approach of looking, using the evolution of the host sequences to tell you something about um, viruses. So you can do this with retroviruses. That, that's what you work on. But can it be done with other viruses as well? Can you look at host genes that... Yes, all we need to know is that there is a virus which interacts with that host gene and causes a selective pressure. So, so, so you talked to Patrick Mitchell, I think, and so he's working on MXA, and he's doing a really interesting story because MXA interacts with lots of different viruses, and if, if we look at the signals that it leaves on that, we can also look at that. And uh, pox, we can start pox, with some other pox viruses must be amenable to this also, right? Sure. Well, there's the PKR story, right, with uh, pox viruses? Yeah. Okay. Yeah and must be a bunch of others. Cause so anything where we have a viral, you know, what we call the accessory gene, but it's say a viral antagonist to a host antiviral gene, and you know where, where the interaction site is, you can look at that interaction site. Pox can keep you busy forever, because it must yeah. have, yeah. you know, 50 or 100 genes that, uh, that interact with, that try and counteract the host uh, response. Now, a lot now, the, of those... The, one of the problems of pox is it is the is the host switching might be too frequent. So you have to also know which host to look in, or which series of hosts to look in. And okay. if it's too broad, um, you might not be able to do it. Yeah. But I, I bet there are pox viruses that can be done. So that's why you said the primate lentis are good for that. because primate lentis are great for that. Okay. Yeah. If, can you also look at a host antiviral protein and not know what the virus is, but look at the pattern of selection pure positive selection and try and guess what virus is applying that pressure? We would love to do that. We keep trying to do that. We keep striking out. But we will succeed one of these days. So we have a list. <laughs> we have our list of, uh, of genes under positive selection that look like they ought to be antiviral right. there and um, we just need a virus to go with them. Yeah, and, you can make some guesses, I guess, yeah. And um, is, there, uh, yeah, is, there, is there any way to approach that? I mean... Uh, 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 to inform your guesses, you know, given a gene that's under positive selection, is there is there a, a, a way to identify what virus it might be? What sorts of things do you think of? Uh, so the approach we've done so far is to test the viruses we have in our freezer, which is probably not okay. the best idea. Um, <laughs> the other is looking at situations where, you know, you have this virus which will infect this species and not that species. And you know that the genes are different between those species. Okay. Um, there, there are a couple cases where you know people. There is an antiviral gene, and people reported that oh, infection by this virus, this gene gets gets um, degraded. For example, so that's the kind of thing. Okay, that's a virus we want to look at. All right. We, we haven't found a great way to do this yet. Um, uh, do other pathogens? cause positive selection? Are there host resistant factors for, for example, bacteria, intracellular bacteria, or even extracellular bacteria, or fungi, or uh, other organisms that are under positive selection as well? Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they are. So one of the, you know, one of the keys for us, since we are virologists, is looking for things that are mostly, that are antiviral, and not kind of anti, more, aren't more broad against other pathogens, or, you know, play a role in, kind of general pathogenic challenge. You know, so something that's kind of at the core of, of the innate immune system, like we can't say that's a, we wouldn't say that's a virus. So we kind of stay away from those things. Okay. Right. One of the things that, looking at the uh, PLOS pathogens paper, one of the things that impressed me, if I understand it correctly, is that uh, the evolution that we're talking about is based on just uh, amino acids at just a couple of sites, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, looking at uh, this figure here that just shows one very small region. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, a seven amino acid stretch, and you're talking at variation in just uh, two of those positions. Yeah, so only a few mutations can be escape mutants. So as long as no, it's under, it's under selection, and we can show that there's a functional difference, and we can trace it back in the tree. We can, we can do a lot with very uh, It very seems to me that, that identifying that as being under positive selection is a, is, I mean, it, 
uh, is, a, is a neat trick. So that, that's where most of our studies start with Harmi, is that the evolutionary analysis um, generates the hypotheses. And then that's where we start the project of what's going on, what's driving it, when is it driven. All right, let me ask you some questions about HIV and the VIF APOBEC 3G, right? So in HIV-1, VIF overcomes APOBEC 3G, right? Yes. In SIV-CPZ, it's the same? Yes. For the chimp, chimps have APOBEC 3G, I presume, mm -hmm. and it's uh, also uh, overcome by VIF, right? Yes. Now the precursor to CPZ, which is some old old world monkey SIV. Yeah, it was a combination of, of That's uh, right, two of them. Red cat mangy bee and the the mustache monkey. Same case for the VIF apobec. So the VIF came from RCM. Red cat mangy from a red cat mangy bee. But that was one of the important transitions of the lentiviruses going from old world monkeys to hominids mm -hmm. to the chimpanzees. Was that the VIF had to adapt because the the RCM VIF does not work very well against the chimpanzee Apobac 3G. And so it, it had to undergo a big adaptation to work. Okay. And the way it adapted was by a deletion of another accessory protein called VPX. And that allowed it to adapt because the VPX and the VIF open reading frames overlap. So by a deletion of VPX created a novel three prime end of SIV CPZ VIF which allowed it to adapt to APOBEC 3G in chimps. And then there was further adaptation in chimps that allowed it to pass to humans. So that's the only way that it could have improved its activity against chimp APOBEC by extending the C-term? It couldn't introduce mutations in the remainder of the protein? So that's the funny thing about evolution is that <laughs> you, don't, you don't know that's the only way. You know that's the way it did it, but you don't know that's the only way it could have happened. But that, that's what it did. And so it actually, it lost the ability to degrade, it lost its one of its genes, it lost its VPX gene. Okay. So it could now no longer degrade same HD1, but it was probably more beneficial to be able to antagonize APOBEC 3G than to antagonize same HD1. So uh, SIVCPZ can no longer antagonize chimp uh, SAM HD1. Yes, right. so SIV from red cat mangy bees has a VPX gene. Yeah. SIV CPZ did not get that VPX gene. Right. It was right. deletion, right. and that deletion created an, a novel VIF gene, which allowed it to adapt to the APOBEC3 so, gene. So as you said, it was more important to antagonize APOBEC than SAM HD1 in the chip. That's what we think, yeah. That's the hypothesis. So uh, do you see this as, I mean, we're talking about a recombinant, okay? Does the progeny from that recombination event that's lost VPX. Is that in, uh, was there evolution beyond that uh, to uh, uh, allow that to overcome Apobec or is this all of a sudden we have a new virus that uh, can grow in this other animal? Yeah, we can't tell the sequence of events. There, there must have been other adaptations. So just, um, just that deletion and creating a new VIF gene wasn't enough. There had to be more adaptations at, at the part that it inherited. So th there was further adaptations, but we can't tell kind of what fitness valley it had to go through to get there. Whether there was an RCM that just happened to have those mutations already or whether it had to adapt further. As I said, like these, these antivirals, they're not kind of all or nothing. So the virus probably can grow a little bit and then there was a selection to get better at it. Okay. So this, let's, the red cap mangabe would not be able to directly infect humans. So the virus from the red cat mangy bee, yeah. its VIF was much more poorly against human apobac 3 g Although maybe the same selection that occurred from red cat mangy bee into chimps could also happen from red cat mangy bee so into humans. So the red cat mangy bee is, it's better at chimps than it is at humans. Okay. So, you know, it kind of depends on what that what that fitness cost was, but it was easier for it to get to chimps than to go directly to humans. Right. So it adapted within the chimp, and so the one in the chimp now is, is completely adapted to humans. Yeah, so if, if, we, if the virus had not gone into chimps, humans would never have acquired it, of course. Yes. But they wouldn't probably have acquired it from old world monkeys either. Right. So there are a lot of viruses in old world monkeys. Yeah. And 
it's not clear yet which ones. So that's one of the things we're, we're doing now is actually which ones are the most threat. So w which ones can work better against the human um, antiviral genes and which ones don't work at all. So are there, is there still contact between people and old world monkeys in, in Africa, for example? Oh, yes, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of bush meat. Ah. Yes. There, there's, there's a lot. And then there's a lot even between chimps say, and old world monkeys. So right. the chimps actually only have this one virus, but they eat a lot of monkeys. That's how they acquired it, right? Well, so they acquired this one. Right. But they haven't acquired other ones. Other uh, lentiviruses. Other lentiviruses that they, um, they prey on animals which harbor other lentiviruses, and right. they may be one of the things we're working on is are they protected against those as well? So the, the, the four groups of HIV represent four separate crossovers from a primate into people, is that correct? Yes, there are so four groups, M, N, O, and P, and they are each independent transmissions. And in each case, so one of them is from chimpanzees, or maybe two of them are from chimpanzees, and so that involves the, um, the, the, the VIF that is active against ApoBec3, chimp and human ApoBec3. What about the other two, do you know? So they all came from a common source of SIV-CPZ, but they were transferred independently. There was only one recombinant SIV-CPZ. Got it. Okay. Um, not all those adapted to humans in the same way, and that's, that's a different story. That's a story about the tethering gene, uh, where the human tethering is different than chimpanzee tethering right. because of a deletion. All right. And so the NEF gene of the CPZ, SIV-CPZ, does not work against human tethering. So HIV adapted um, changes in the VPU gene to allow it to work against human tethering. This is going to be really hard for listeners to follow. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm just at, for, at, at the end, at the edge, right. but I'm trying to. <clears throat> right, yeah. well, I've, so SIV2 went from a sooty mangabe right into people. It HIV2. Didn't, right? Why didn't, yes. have to, why didn't it have to pass through a chimp? The Sudi Mangabe virus is incredibly um, adaptive. And it, it already seems to be pre-adapted to almost, almost everything. So, if, for example, its VIF gene works against almost all the Apobacs. Almost all the, of all the species you've tested. Of all the species we tested. There's a couple that doesn't work again, but it, it was already pre-adapted to humans. It's already pre-adapted to macaques. It, um, so it didn't have to go through a chimp because it was already pre-adapted to humans. Okay, but it's not very pathogenic in people, right? That's true. Why, yes. do we know what is associated with that? Is there an antagonism from people that m mediates that? Uh, uh, Apobec or SAMHD1 or Tetherin or <laughs> Trim? Um, we don't know. There sh is likely a problem with Tetherin because it, it most of the HIV-2s will not work very well against human tethering, but HIV-2 is such a different virus from HIV-1. I mean, it's nowhere near on the tree. That There are lots of differences. And yep. it, it's really hard to say why it is different. Okay. So you can go back into each of these old world monkeys and their, their SIVs and determine the efficiency of VIF versus apobec in each in each one, right? Yes, that's what we do. So in each species is the is the virus able to overcome apobec? so for example the red capped mangabe is that right? red capped mangabe, which is one of the donors of virus that infected chimps, the a VIF of that virus overcomes the red cap mangabe apobec three G? Yes. So each virus, which is now in that species, has found a way to overcome. Okay. Now there are in each species that actually there can be polymorphisms, where they are now kind of escaping. So we have found that, for example, in the African green monkeys, where there are low frequency, there are polymorphisms in ApoBec 3G that allow it to protect it from other SAVs from African okay. monkeys. Okay. Okay. Can I keep going here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't mean to... to no, 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 you're fine. I just got a bunch of questions. You, you, you just keep going. You're, you're on a roll. So, um, is it... Are we, so, you said it earlier that we could still be infected with uh, old world monkey SIVs because there's a lot of bushmeat trade. Is that also the case for chimps? Are there so fewer of them and there's no chimp bushmeat that that's not a threat any longer? Or is it still... No, it could be a threat. That's, that's an interesting question. So... Uh, chimpanzees eat a lot of colobus monkeys, 
Okay. They have a virus, SIV colobus, but no one has found SIV colobus in chimpanzees. The hypothesis that we have not yet tested that is that there was a more ancient virus in chimpanzees that swept through and now they are protected against these other viruses. And the SIV CPZ is actually a more recent uh, more recent acquisition. But if in time, they would become resistant to that virus as well, right? Yes. And it, it, but they probably will be extinct before that happens, the way things are going there, right? They're being... But not because of the virus, because of... Right. People because are hunting people. them, yes. right? And right. Yeah, yeah, that's a different problem. Yeah. And not all... So I, my understanding is that there are separate colonies of chimps in Africa, and they don't mix at all, right? They're different subspecies. And... Um, some have virus and others do not, right? Yeah, so two of the four have, have viruses. And two, so PTT, two the, right? Pantroglodytes, troglodytes is one. And PTS. Schweinfurthi. Don't make me try to say it. Schweinfurthi. Yeah. <laughs> and then the bon bonobos do not have... And bonobos, so bonobos broke off uh, much earlier from the other subspecies of chimps, and they do not have viruses. Did you, did you check their apoBAC and other factors against the other viruses and see if they're active? We're doing that. Nah, I'm sorry. So we, we've done some. Um, we've done some, and they're not a lot different than chimps, but we haven't done it at, at, at a lot of depth. We're doing that now. This is so cool. I love this stuff. Yeah, it really is great stuff. And Thank I'm you. just, uh, I'm, I, I was reminded as we were talking about the, the content of this paper that we're talking about, because it's, it's a really nice um, a combination of the genetics and the functional assays, because you... The genetics uh, uh, gives you a clue or gives you ideas as to whether or not uh, a given viral protein ought to be active against a right. given cellular protein. And then the assays that you do, you actually express these in the context of an infection. Is that right? Yes, we do infections. Uh, yes. And then, so you, you make constructs, right? Virus constructs that contain these different uh, uh, VIF genes and then and express also the different apobex and ask whether in combination uh, the virus uh, uh, gene will degrade the apobex. Is that what they do? Yes. So we look for degradation and we look for virus. So these virus are not replication. hard experiments. You get the sequences first, right? You have to get that, but then these are relatively straightforward. A, uh, so you can get a lot of information from a pretty Easy assay. I don't know if you remember the saying, Hershey don't Heaven. Don't anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're, the, the, the assays themselves are not difficult. Yeah. There's a lot of cloning involved, right? So the, the, the hard part is, is, that, is, is figuring out what, what, what the question is. Uh -huh. But no, the, the actual part is not, is not technically that difficult. Uh, what about uh, gorillas? What's the story? They don't, do they have SIVs? Yes, they do. Um, so definitely um, group P, HIV-1 group P, came, um, from, gorillas, yeah. came from, from chimps to gorillas to humans. And um, there's another one which may or may not have come from gorillas. But yes, there is one in gorillas. And have you looked at the apoback VIF in gorilla? We're starting to do that too. So that's part of the bonobo gorilla right. thing project. So do we know how it went from chimps to gorillas? The virus? No, we don't. Because chimps eat other monkeys, but I don't know that. I don't know much about gorillas, but I don't think they eat other monkeys, do they? Um, other chi or chimps? Somebody told me about this once, and now I can't remember. They fight. They, they fight. fight. Okay, so yeah. they fight. There was blood involved. So you must know um, <laughs> Beatrice Hahn, or yeah, she's on. She's on one of these papers. Yes. Yeah. So I had, really well. I had her daughter in my virology class really? <laughs> two years ago. She was my TA this semester. Wow. Okay. That's and neat. I didn't even know <laughs> she was in the class. <laughs> she could have given you a seminar about, um, about isn't that cool? viruses. So yeah. I, teach, I give a lecture on HIV and its origins, and I tell the students, your TA's mother did this. <laughs> this. Is it so wow, cool? Isn't that really cool? cool? How that often can cool. you say that's that? That's very cool. And she, wants, she wants to go to medical school. Or maybe she'll be a scientist. So... Um, you are doing similar kinds of analyses for the other HIV accessory proteins that have targets in cells, like um, tetherin and SAMHD1. Yes. In, in different, again, primates, different primates as well. So your focus is on lentiviruses and primates. 
focuses on lentiviruses and primates. With the, so the major question is why are humans so susceptible to HIV-1? And you know, part of that question is because of the past evolution of these antiviral genes in, in primate ancestors. So both kind of why are we so susceptible to HIV-1 and what are we resistant to? Yeah. Are other SIVs a, a problem or not? If we were able to eradicate uh, HIV, Tony Fauci thinks with antivirals, but maybe with a vaccine, there's, there's still a threat of reintroduction of similar lentiviruses from chimps or maybe old world monkeys. Would, would our antivirals work against those? Yes, they would. They would, right? Yeah. I mean, most of the antivirals are, the antivirals can be broad against you know, the conserved yeah. enzymes. But it would just be a matter of how soon we would pick up such a cross-species infection, right? It took us a long time for HIV from the 20s to 1980s, right? Yeah, it would be easier now. Because we would know what to look for, right? We would know what to look for. It's pretty spooky, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always thought that this was a one-time thing. Well, actually, there have probably been many, many cross-infections of lentis into people, but HIV-1 really took off probably because of other factors besides the virus. I don't know if you subscribe to those theories of colonization being a part of the spread. Yeah, right? yeah. So hey, have you read the, the book, The Origin of AIDS yeah. by Jack Pepin? Yeah. That, that's a great... Do you believe that? Because I, I do. I thought but, it was very convincing. Um, I thought he, he told it was a great book. Yeah. But it, so there are four introductions of HIV-1 into humans, and there are, I think, we're up to nine introductions of HIV-2 into right. humans. Right, right. So it's not that rare. So... No, it, this is what got amplified, but it certainly happened before that. Yeah. And if so, there could be an introduction now that we don't know of yet, right? If it was just a few people, you would know it. Well, don't some of these um, uh, subtypes exist in just a few people? Like, even, I think some of the HIV-2 uh, types exist only in a few patients. Yeah, the HIV, the, some of the HIV-2s you can actually see like where they came from, because they, they are related to monkeys in a certain area, and, and they haven't expanded. So there are only two HIV-2 clays which have expanded. Yeah. But like HIV-1 group P, there's only a couple people. So essentially, we, we do surveil. Well, in Africa, if someone has, develops AIDS, um, you will see what virus they have in them, and so we would pick up a new reintroduction. So that's what happens when they have discovered these new uh, groups, is they... There's a lot of work in development of ELISA assays that, that are broad enough to pick up all of them. So actually, they would get picked up in, in, a, in ELISA assays. Can I ask you an unrelated question? Um, why, so many retroviruses endogenize their hosts. They go into the germline. But HIV in people has not. And I presume it has not in chimps or any old world monkeys that we know of either. Is that correct? Or maybe lemurs are, lemurs. The, only, lemurs the, are lemurs. the only primate to have endogenous lentivirus? Yes, lemurs have an endogenous lentivirus. So why don't the others have endogenous lentiviruses? So the, the act of endogenation is, is such a rare thing. Is that it has to get to the germline. It has to get integrated in a place that's not going to do too much harm. It has to get passed to the next generation. It needs to get fixed in the population. It's just, chances of that happening are just so rare that the fact you find them just means that there must have been such a heavy burden, viral burden, on the species. And yet, and yet uh, there are our lower. genomes are just loaded with these. Yeah, so that's one of the arguments of that there have been so many ancient viral infections of human ancestors that have left this fossil record. Virus, genomic fossil record. This genomic fossil record of viruses that are no longer present in the world. So they are now extinct, but at one point they were active. So the lentiviruses, so it's hard to know which of those factors. So it could be that it is too pathogenic to get fixed in the germline. Okay. That, Ki that never survives. So it kills germ cells, right? Yeah. Okay. Or it never infects the germ cells. Or um, people have not found it. So if uh, a human today were endogenized somewhere in the world, okay, by this rare event, how long would it be before that propagated to enough humans that we would see it? many years would that take? Yeah, you know, again, it depends on the selection. You know, if it's completely neutral, yeah. you, could, you could calculate kind of by population size how long it would take to, if it got 
how long would they get fixed? And then when I taught population genetics, I used to know this answer. Yeah. But I can't remember right it's now. It's probably thousands <laughs> of years, right? Oh, it's longer than that. Ten millions of years, maybe? If it's, well, we're not going to be around that long, are we? I don't think so, no. Well, the, you know, the generation time of humans is, what, 25 years? But So there are cases like that of kind of new endogenization in, in humans. So the um, HHV6, for example, you know, integrates near telomeres. And so that's an example of, you know, they see cases of people who are positive for HHV6, and it, it was a germline integration. Uh, and they okay. see this in families, right? Yes, yeah, and you yeah. see it in families. Right. And so that's the kind of thing where you could actually ask, you know, how is it, how is that spreading? So, I mean, that's a real, a real example, not a theoretical one. Right, right. Yeah, and by understanding the, uh, understanding the frequency of that, you could probably date events. I don't know how many independent events there, I don't know how you discriminate independent events. By integration site. Yeah, integration site. By integration site. site. Yeah, 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 you could do that. I mean, it could be done. So as we sequence everybody's Genome. Eventually, we have we'll a know. huge amount of information for virologists, in particular. Right? We can track a lot of these integrations and see how they move in populations. Mm -hmm. HSV six has been around for a while, though, right? Yes. So that would be that would be really interesting. So, after all of this, remind me again how old lentiviruses are, <laughs> based on this evolutionary biology. So the primate lentiviruses we calculate are about at least 10 million years old, okay. between five and 10 million years old. And so that's a minimum age. And where did they come from? We don't know where they came from. So the virus in lemurs is actually much, much different than the one in other primates. So you can't actually, it's different enough that you can't form a hypothesis of it, you know, it came from prosimians, for example. Uh, the one in the felines is, is much, much different. So, no, we actually don't know where it came from. We, there isn't quite another species with the same kind of constellation of genes where you could probably say that this is where it came from. But maybe it's out there and we haven't found it yet. Yes. It's possible, right? definitely could be out there and we haven't Because we haven't it. sequenced everything. Now, my understanding is that the, the koala uh, virus, which is endogenizing them, may have come from a mouse, right? Um, most likely, yeah. So the uh, a rodent, anyway. A rodent, yeah. The endogenous retroviruses that we find in human genomes. How far back does that? How far back does that go? How old are they? Uh, the newest ones are a couple hundred thousand years old. So there are ones which are polymorphic in humans. And so they are after the spread from out of Africa. So they are a couple hundred thousand years. I think the herb herb K one one three one one four or something like that. Um, you know, it, when they go back, there are ones which are shared between all hominids, ones which are shared between all primates, ones which are shared with prosimians, ones which are shared between all mammals. So they go back way, way back. Okay. But you can kind of date when they were acquired by what species all have them. So this has been, this bombardment with retroviruses is constant and goes back all the way to the beginning of mammals. Probably not constant, actually, when you ask kind of when they integrate, they, they go in bursts. Hmm. So it's not constant, it's episodic, where you can see a big burst at one time in evolution and then nothing happens for a while and then something comes back again. Hmm. But it goes back a long time. So how old are viruses? A uh, virus, well, some viruses probably predate cellularization. Oh, I was gonna there ask you go. that, All good. Right. I, I tell my students that and they say, how, I thought viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. But you think they could predate cellular life, right? I don't know anything about it. I just know what I read. <laughs> and, and I need, it's hard for me to read those papers. So but maybe the that's RNA, what they say. The RNA viruses could have been way back then, right? Yes, that the RNA viruses came from the RNA milieu. Yeah, the I mean, I'm asking, you, I'm asking you because you have a you have a view of evolution that we don't have, right? So I'm curious about that. And the other is, where do you think these giant DNA viruses? fit in, the Mimi viruses, which have huge genomes and mm -hmm. lots of genes that no other virus has. What, what, what's the story there? Yeah, so that's always the question of what, did they, did they contribute the nucleus, for example? Did they contribute, right. were they there before, beforehand? Um, you know, they have a different evolutionary history than the small RNA viruses. 
that, you know, the positive strain RNA viruses likely have a different evolutionary history than the negative strain RNA viruses, which have a different evolutionary history than the double-stranded DNA viruses. So you mentioned Actually, don't know that you used the word in one of these uh, papers, co-speciation, um, and I, my impression from that is that uh, the there can be viruses uh, that uh, evolve along with their hosts over a long period of evolutionary time. Is that, right. is that correct thinking on that? Yes. So there are viruses which co-evolve with their host. So, for example, many of the herpes viruses, the foamy retroviruses are good examples, probably papillomaviruses, evolve with their hosts. And then there are viruses which do not. There are viruses which come and go. And you, know, you can tell that by lining up a phylogenetic tree of the viruses and a phylogenetic tree of the host. You know, if they match up completely, that's coevolution. But with many viruses, they don't add up, they don't line up at all. So uh, you mentioned kind of papilloma viruses and herpes viruses as uh, things that may co-evolve with their hosts. Uh, can you give me examples of ones that do not? The uh, Marbili viruses, for example, like measles. Okay. So if you line up, you know, all the Marbili viruses, so you know, measles, um, um, canine distemper virus, I'm blanking all the names, but you, you line them up and you line up the host and they don't line up at all. You know, so measles is, is closest to a virus of cattle and the next closest one is something of seals. So does that imply that the human experience with those viruses is a zoonosis? Uh, that we have acquired those viruses from some other reservoir as opposed to coevolution? I'm trying to put Yes. That, okay. So um, one way or the other, either we infected them or they infected us. But that's the evolution of, of many of the RNA viruses, is that they go from species to another species, that they don't co-evolve with the species. They go extinct in that species, and then there's a reacquisition from another source, from another. Interesting. So do you see a fundamental difference between RNA and DNA viruses in this, in this fashion? Yes. Yeah, so the DNA viruses tend to co-evolve with their host. Um, the RNA viruses tend not to. And with, that, with exceptions. And uh, in, in, in your mind, is that exception? Okay. In your mind, does that have to do uh, with the fundamental issues of uh, mutation rate? Uh, I'm not sure it's mutation rate so much as um, their ability to persist. You know, so viruses which are acquired at birth, and then um, are lifelong infections. So those are good candidates for things which would co-evolve with their host. Okay. You know, and then are acquired the next generation near birth again. Okay. Those are examples of, of ones which co-evolve. Okay, as opposed to acute infection. As opposed to acute infection, infection where there's no way the virus can stay within its host without going to a new host. Wow. So this is what I'm you're going to... i This is what you're... This is great. This is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your career, right? These kinds of paleovirology studies that we've been talking about. That's a hard question. Um, so I've been doing it for the last eight years, anyway, or so. I mean, it's fun. I can imagine if I were just starting, I'd do this stuff. Yeah. I'd just do another virus because you're going to learn something different, right? Yeah. Just and to stay out of your territory, that would be cool. <laughs> do a lot of people do this? I get the impression that there aren't many. There aren't that many. Um, there are the people who have trained with Harmeet and I. Yeah. Um, like Sarah Sawyer and Nels Elvin. Nels, right, right. They go um, off and start. And... Um, there are other practitioners, so uh, Welkin Johnson, for example, talked to whom I think, Amelia Talenti in Lausanne. There are other people who are thinking along these lines. So, I mean, I think that's one of the things that we have contributed, that people start to think right. along this line, even if they're not kind of doing the same, exact same approach. We were actually doing a project with Harmeet with polio and an antiviral host factor, which we know is cleaved by polio. Mm -hmm. We don't know where it's cleaved, so we're helping, hoping he can give us some clues. Yeah, that's what... Right? And by looking at the residues that are positively selected. Uh, cool. Mm -hmm. Not bad, right? Yeah, not oh, bad. I really like this stuff. Um, can I talk about virology a bit? The, sure, the journal? You just became the editor-in-chief of the journal. Virology. Yeah, I became editor-in-chief um, in January. January so why did, you, why did you want to do that? you got enough to do here, right? I saw it as a challenge. Yeah. I thought it was something to be fun. I mean, I like to do... Even though I work on only lentiviruses, I actually like to learn about lots of viruses. And so, um, you know, looking at, 
at virology in a larger sense was something that I like doing that kind of thing. Is there anything that you plan to change? Uh, yeah, we've made a lot of changes. Um, so you're already on board, I presume. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing this for a while. So virology, the 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 journal virology. This always is conf nomenclature really is confusing. There are two. Uh, well, there's more than two. Uh, there are several. <laughs> I, I want to be careful here not to offend anybody. There are several virology specialty journals, right? There's right. virology published by Elsevier. There's Journal of Virology published by uh, what we call a society journal, the American ASM. Society for mm -hmm. Virology. There's uh, no, American Society of Microbiology. There, I'm sorry, ASM, American Society for Viro uh, Microbiology. Microbiology. There's uh, Virus Research. That's also an Elsevier journal. Is that correct? I'm not sure. And, I don't know. and there's a couple of others. Journal okay? of General Virology. Journal of General Virology, which is a, a British uh, society journal, right? And don't forget Archives of Virology, right. which used to be Archiv for die Virus Geschämte Forschung or something Very like that good. when I was a wow. student. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah. They changed the name because nobody could <laughs> I love the name of that journal. Um, but virology is, uh, was sort of the first uh, if I'm not mistaken, specialty virology journal, at least in the U.S., if not in the world. Is that right? Yes, it was the oldest one. It was founded in 1955, and I'm only the fourth editor-in-chief since then. Uh, it's interesting to me that that was established as a commercial, with a commercial publisher. At the time, it was Academic Press, I think, mm -hmm. uh, rather than as a society journal. To, I mean, because ASM existed way before that, do you have any idea why that, why that decision was made? No, I don't. Okay, but at any rate, so uh, Journal of Virology came up subsequently. All right, so this is was established in 1950. You're the fourth editor. 55, yeah. 55. Yeah, everyone else has done it for about 20 years. Okay. So, is your Virology going to? Is it open access? It's not. It's a subscription journal, correct? Uh, right, so it's open archive, which means that all articles are um, open access after 12 months. It has an open access option, which is you know, about the same price, a little bit cheaper than most of the other open access journals. Of you know, People can make it immediate open access. The reviews are all open access, and in every issue there's, two, there's one or two articles which are immediate open access as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Is that going to change at all? Is that the model that the publisher wants to keep? I don't know. So, I mean, I do the editorial part of it. I don't do the business part of it. So, I mean, in, do you have any view in general about whether science articles should be open or not? No, open is better. Yeah, as you know, there's a big movement towards open access. There's PLOS journals, which are all open access and seem to survive on that kind of a model. Yeah. I mean, it's good to have options because, you know, especially when grants are tight. So the advantage of a journal like Virology is that there are no page charges. Right. There are no color charges. And so you can publish good science in Virology and it doesn't cost you $2,000. Depending on how many articles you publish a year, that, that can get to be a lot. I don't have a problem with that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but I think even for one article, it's a lot of money. I totally agree. That's always been an attraction of that journal. So that was a good move that they made years ago to not charge that much, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you see any particular advantage or disadvantage from having uh, more than one virology specialty journal? No, I think it's a biggest advantage. I mean, each journal has different editors Different editors, you know, have their own kind of um, bias of you know what they like, what they don't like. I think it's important to to have have options. It's you know each one kind of ends up being like a lot of articles in a certain area go to this journal because that's where the other ones went. Uh huh. You know, I think you need to have you need to have more than one and. You know, it's, it's also good for the innovation of, you know, each journal is not kind of coasting. They're kind of trying, trying to do better things right. and okay. do new things. Right, okay. That makes sense. 
How about if I read a couple of emails that Michael might be interested in? Uh, yeah. So we, That's good. as part of TWIV, we get email from listeners. Okay. Lots of them. And um, I wanted to read two because they have, happen to be from your former or current people. I don't know. One is from Shari, who said, as a graduate student with Michael from 2002 to 2006, I can say, not only is he a fantastic virologist, he's the best mentor I have ever had. And be sure to check out the bobblehead in his likeness in his office. He was awarded this as part of a mentorship award he received last year. Enjoy. Yeah, there's the bobblehead. <laughs> right behind you, Rich. Yeah. And uh, in fact, um, so Sherry left this on Facebook. We have a Facebook page for the podcast. And yesterday I had posted that I was going to come record a TWIV with you. So she wrote that. Mm -hmm. She said, enjoy. If you remember Shari, I guess. Of course I remember Shari. Yeah. Her thesis is right there. <laughs> and then was one from Molly. Yeah, you Molly's thesis is Molly's right next to that. that. <laughs> Hello, Team TWIV. I am a longtime listener and avid fan of TWIV. I had the great fortune to attend the live taping of TWIV in Berkeley and was excited to meet Vincent face to face. Thanks for the visit out west, Vincent. We hope to see you again soon. As a follow up to TWIV 228, I wanted to address a point brought up by Vincent regarding whether or not eradication of dengue would be possible given an effective vaccine can be developed. As Dr. Harris alluded to, there is in fact documented sylvatic cycles of all ser four serotypes of dengue in forest dwelling primates. Similar to other viruses, HIV comes immediately to mind. There have only been a handful of cases where sylvatic dengue virus has successfully spilled over and established itself in the human population causing the four pandemic serotypes currently circulating in humans. And she links to a review in Nature Microbiology of the current understanding of sylvatic dengue. Sounds like this could be another subject for an analysis like we talked about. It could be. Right? We could figure out how long dengue has been in primates using this approach. So the four, I assume from what she's saying, is the four human serotypes can be tracked to the primate Hosts yes. in the forest. Right. I didn't know that. I mean, you know, we've, we've talked about this off and on, and some people poo poo this sylvatic cycle as contributing to epidemics of dengue right now, which I think is probably correct, but it's certainly the origin of right. it. Right. Yeah, she's talking about right. the origins. Right. Okay. Yeah. So say. Molly was a graduate student in my lab, and then she went to work with Eva Harris on dengue virus. Uh, and she writes, on a side note, you should really get Eddie Holmes, one of the authors of the review she cites on TWIV. You won't be disappointed. It's interesting that on rare occasion, direct infection of humans with sylvatic strains has been associated with symptomatic disease, including severe deng dengue disease. All right, so that contradicts what I just said. So there are cases where <laughs> you can get zoonotic infections. I don't know how many there are, though. Maybe it doesn't contribute to the overall burden. Well, it can happen. So, you know... Yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is a moving target, the here, whole thing. Here she addresses it. It may be that more sylvatic infections than the handful that have been directly observed are, are occurring, but we simply don't know about them as current screening technologies, antibody-based and nucleic acid-based, would pick these up but would not distinguish them from the current four human pandemic serotypes. Okay. In light of all this, dengue eradication may not be a viable possibility unless circulation of dengue in primate reservoirs can also be eliminated. Well, it's possible that a vaccine may protect against sylvatic strains. I suppose that vaccination would have to be continued indefinitely to ensure that sylvatic strains do not once again spill over and transmit in humans. And as final note, thanks for all your hard work. You have all mentioned the important role that mentorship plays in the lives of young scientists. I most wholeheartedly agree as I have had the pleasure of experiencing fabulous mentorship firsthand, in particular from Michael Ammerman. Quite possible, in my unbiased opinion, the world's best grad school mentor. <laughs> I also want to let you know that I and others consider Team TWIV mentors and tremendous ones at that. Thanks for all your candid scientific and career advice and for putting your passion for science on display on a weekly basis. As I contemplate the next step in my career, I look to TWIV to keep me up to speed on what is new in virology and appreciate your collective wisdom regarding careers in science. I consider TWIV a valuable resource. And she sends us a pick of the week, the facts in the case of Dr. Andrew Wakefield. Thanks and keep up the good work. Molly, former postdoc of Eva Harris and PhD student of Michael Emmerman and Harmit Malik currently teaching virology to bright post students at UC Berkeley, extension and plotting my next move. <laughs> so you see why I read these two. Because Absolutely. Yeah. 
they uh, yeah. emphasize the talents of Michael Ehrman, who is here with us today. And uh, this episode of TWIV, like all the others, will be at iTunes and at TWIV TV, TWIV.TV. And if you like us, go over to, t to iTunes and leave a rating or some stars, and that helps us to keep it visible and get more subscribers. We love to get your questions and comments. Send them to TWIV at TWIV.TV. You know, one of the students we met today said they don't like the all-email episode. Well, it was just one student. <laughs> Tough <They> can, <laughs> Sometimes they we can, have to catch up, yeah. and um, we do all episodes with only email. Uh -huh. You know, because yeah, email accumulates. And I think the email is great because they, really, they send us on lots of. Sometimes yeah. we only get to five or six because we talk so much right. in tangents. So it's like doing another show, I guess. Michael Emmerman is at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research. Senator, thank you so much for talking with thank us you. today. Thank you. Oh, this is terrific. I have a lot of new stuff to think about and a lot of new perspective. This is terrific. That's cool stuff. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Vincent. It's always a pleasure. This is a good time. It's too bad I'm finished with study section. won't be able to do these anymore. Well, Although, you can commute to Washington when I go. I still if have you, uh, duty. If you do them in Washington, so Rich will be on the study section for a couple more years. And if you... Uh, want to do one in Washington now and then, just, you know where to reach me. Yep. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Mm -hmm.